welcome to Trust the Journey. I'm Jason Maledsky. Our mission is to live, laugh, love, and learn together with you. We're here to create conscious connections through our practice of openness, honesty, vulnerability, humility, and trust. Trusting the entire journey. Across the wider internet, our handle is trustthejourney.today. That'll get you to our Spotify, our YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Patreon, or directly to our website. If you go to our website, you can sign up on the Donate Now button for Patreon and become a member of the Trust the Journey family, where we have this wonderful group of people that are supporting each other, vulnerably sharing, engaging each other. Just, it's an awesome group. We'd love to have you, and we'd love if you would subscribe on Patreon. If you can't make a monetary donation, you'll please subscribe on YouTube or on Spotify. We'd also like to thank our podcast production team, Kimberly Joy Voice. She does a wonderful job. If you want to reach her, you can get her at KimberlyJoyVoice.com. And today, I'm hosting another episode of our show where we bring on wonderful guests. It is Walking Each Other Home. It's a show where I get to speak with interesting, wonderful people who have similar depth of journey that are engaging this life fully and really exploring and, and giving everything we've got to like looking deep inside ourselves and sharing the journey with each other and supporting each other and literally walking each other home because inevitably this life comes to an end. So let's get everything we can out of it while we're here and try and understand ourselves and each other and support each other during that journey. So today I'm very excited to have my good friend Andy Lewis on the show. Andy is either famous or infamous, depending on who you speak to, for his exploits and adventures. Uh, comes from a history of slacklining, highlining, uh, all kinds of aerial antics, rock climbing, base jumping. Um, and we first got to know each other on a sailboat in the Maldives. We spent a couple of weeks cruising around surfing. And since then, we've become very good friends. Multiple events all over the world. Um, Burning Man a number of times. We're both local residents here in Moab. so. It's a real pleasure to have you on the show, Andy. Thank you very much for joining us. Honor and pleasure myself. Absolutely. Yeah. Good to see you. Yeah. Thanks. So um, I wanted to kind of dive in right away with some questions around one of the things that I really love about you. Okay. So let's be straight up. I know that you're a deep thinker, right? And you express yourself very beautifully with your words. And I read everything that you share and post. It's all really deep and important stuff. And I, I hear you bear your heart a lot when you're trying to get into the things that are really, they're important to you and they mean things to you. And, and I know how you care about or your community and the places that you live and the places that you go and, you know, the people that you spend your time with. So I just wanted to give you the floor a little bit and kind of speak towards that side of yourself. You know, I, I think you're, you're known for your colorful, outgoing character. And I wanted to kind of touch the heart a little bit and, and see where that leads us. Yeah, I would say that, I kind of got off on the wrong foot with a lot of people. <laughs> I, can agree with, <laughs> I can agree with that. Um, I, uh, I grew up white, male. And me too. Affluent and educated. And by doing so, I put myself in a vulnerable position by um, becoming jaded to the fact that that's not something that happens to everyone. And so it uh, gave me this pompous, egotistical, almost um, rude, actually very rude sense of being better than people. Hmm. And so I grew up um, in a very judgmental society. Um, number one, winning. There's definitely losers where I came from. And today, no one's a loser, which I think there's a big, there's a balance there that needs to be seen because losing is important. You don't want to get to your 20s and the first person who calls you a loser is your boss while he's firing you. Mm. Look, Bobby, you're a loser. Get your stuff. Get out of here. Yeah, yeah but, there, there's a lot of lessons to be learned in fail, yeah, failure, right? Exactly. So yeah. failure is a great lesson. And I see that uh, in my life, I've always gone from aspiration to success to failure and like completed this triangle over and over and over again. Mm. And so um, in doing all those things, I became kind of pompous and kind of aggressive in terms of winning. But it wasn't until later in my life that I realized that I just wanted first place rather than actually wanting to do my best. And so to um, do your best is more important than winning first. So if you can get first place only giving 60%, 
you're actually not fulfilling your full potential. And so I graduated marketing school from Humboldt State University with a marketing degree, business right, degree. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah and uh, recreational administration. I actually was valedictorian from class of 2008. <laughs> so, Winner. yeah, so I was, <laughs> I was a winner. I fucking loved winning and learning and being the best and overachieving, but also kind of using the system. So it wasn't just learning the material, it was learning your teachers. It was kind of like playing poker where I'm not playing the game, I'm playing the players. Mm -hmm. And so by manipulating the system, I wouldn't have to work as hard because my teacher would give me everything that I needed. If I was writing an essay, I'd show up after class and say, hey, what kind of essay would you like to see? What kind of material would you like to have in this? What kind of thoughts would you like to pro and I'd let them give me all the information to write an essay that they wanted to hear and then I'd provide them something that I'd get an A on but it wasn't actually like fully incorporating my own skills and power and then I used that manipulation that I learned in marketing to manipulate people in my entire life just to to gain whatever I could out of them so I saw people as tools and I wanted to use them as tools and I would use that as engagement and engagement was more important than actually having a purpose. So getting people to be angry, happy, sad, whatever emotional reaction I could get out of people by doing whatever I wanted, that attention was valuable. And it wasn't about whether it was good or bad attention. It was about attention in general, which was addictive. And so it wasn't until later in life I realized that I was an addict to everything. Everything. So like, everything. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't just addicted to winning or addicted to attention or addicted to success or addicted to projects or sex or friends or being, I, I just wanted to be popular. I wanted to be famous. I wanted to be I was, everything that I, in my heart was afraid I wasn't. And so it was like this huge explosion to where I started um, playing with Slackline. That's kind of where that all. When did of, that start? That must have started in 2004, okay. where I took a road trip when I was 17 with two of my friends, David Gumbiner and George Upton. It was all three of our first times like away from home, like on our own, in our own car. And when we ended that trip, I had like a cat that I'd adopted from my family that we stopped in in Oregon and like get a cat in the car for our journey. And I picked up Slackline like just during that trip where we saw them in camp four in Yosemite, but we didn't actually learn. It wasn't until August afterwards where my friend George learned from him, his brother Charles that we set up a line that kind of gave me this ability to have an artistic expression of sports and everything you could do on the ground, you could do on the line. And that's where Slack Life came from. And that's kind of where I was moving my own progression forward was I was like creating a language. So that was really fun to me. And it was also something I could like get really good attention with. And it was also something that was new, which I found a key in because. I mean, new in like the cultural aspect, like new as in people didn't know about it. Yeah. New as in like everything that you did was kind of like a world record mm -hmm. or. Yeah. You yeah, had the same experience. But it yeah. also made people angry. And I loved that. Mm. I loved that I could set up a slack line anywhere and the fire department would show up. Or I'd set up a slack line between a bridge and the police would come with guns and think we're rigging bombs and they'd take our gear. And it's great to like post that because you get attention. And then being an addict, you love attention. You love slack line. You love progression. You love making tricks. You love making names. You love making community because it was about that. It was all about that. Pushing, growing, learning, and then having everybody else build you up. But, um, in doing so, you kind of rub people the wrong way a lot. And I kind of had to like balance when I should care about that and when I shouldn't care about that. And I just was very considerate all the time to myself about whether I should or shouldn't care about that. And I always chose not to care about that. I just didn't need to. I didn't care what other people had to. I, I just didn't care. Didn't care. A lot of the times I would just think about it and not care. But I always thought about it. And now I'm like thinking about how that affects other people, how that affects laws and how slacklining is still banned in Boulder. Like still to it's this banned day. Like, yeah, you can't go slacklining in certain areas. And that's, that's like, like banning oh, skateboarding, right? It, it, it totally is. Of, but yeah, like, yeah. 
that was like, yo, it was all this dude, you know, and you could be kind of like proud of that or whatever you want to. But in the end, it's kind of like, was that the way that it needed to happen? And so I'm kind of like picking up the pieces and kind of like trying to fix different things. And um, I would say that that's kind of where my journey took me was um, to fame and infamy to where equally equally so it eh? was equally so so like as an egotist i equally was doing these fantastic things and like pushing myself and pushing the boundaries and inspiring but at the same time undermining my character in the opposite direction Mm -hmm. so like as an egotist you're constantly taking away and creating in both directions equally because you can never satisfy your ego and so having to deal with that and break down and understand what ego is and how to combat ego and how who you are is way more important than what you do those kind of things i still am struggling with today mm. obviously yeah, we, all, we all do <laughs> i mean but we all do right so yeah. i'm gonna uh, share a quote with you that my one of my early coaches and became a lifelong friend joey jones shared with me a long time ago and he said sometimes jay the best balance has found furthest from center you know, so that concept of like the egotist, like where we need to try to be, you know, it's our characters over here, but then our actions are over here and who we really want to be is over here. And it spreads us out and gives us that greater point of balance. You know, I see on the slack line that the arms are out to the sides, the balance points in the middle. But, you know, that that little bit of shift from one end to the other really, really affects things. So there's an interesting analogy in life in reference to that, how when we get away from our center point, we actually grow as humans and we expand and we get, you know, a smaller input can make a greater result in our overall, you know, center point or balance. And it's always moving. It is always moving. So it's like, it's the dynamic nature of trying to balance it at all times. And it's always new people, new challenges, new progress new goals, new failures, new successes, new aspirations, and in a circle. How much of your, um, how much of your identity as a young man was tied up in your exploits or the things that were about like what you did versus who you are to like then versus now, like how much of that, can you scale that at all? Oh God, I would say it was 120% of mm-hmm. my exploits. Yeah. I needed, I needed to be famous. Mm-hmm. needed to be known and I wanted to be famous like I wanted to be the best that slack liner yeah. in the world well it, was, it started with Dean Potter and I loved the way that Dean mm. um, took extreme sports and turned it into art as as though the expression of his physical movement and mental fortitude doing these absolutely extraneous <laughs> things in life mm-hmm. uh that emotional connection that he translated was beautiful to me. And so it became art. So that's the way I started to look at the world was artistically speaking. And a lot of people try to find reasons to live, but like, what would you die for? And so trying to like, what would you like, what would you die for? Mm -hmm. And a lot of people wouldn't die for anything. And so for the longest time, I like knew it was okay to die for the shit I was doing. And so. So, so for the longest time, is that, is that still the case in those aspects? Like, do you feel that shifting at all? Oh, the shift was monumental. I used to go onto the trick line, what I called battlefield. And I'd look at my opponents and be like, Hey, if you guys aren't willing to die today, you're probably not getting first place. Yeah, I, I, I mean, you and I are friends for a reason that we're very similar in our personalities and character that yeah. we've started off on this thing of like, I'll do anything to be the best at what I've chosen to do. I will risk everything to do it. And I just for the pursuit of that championship title, like I just want to know that I'm excellent at something so that I validate myself through this external presentation of who I am as a character, as a player in a game, but there's really no value in it. We come, we get a little older and we realize that's not worth shit. When I sit there by myself at night alone and there's nobody else there to validate me except for me, whatever I did on that swoop or that trick line, I'm making a shit a difference. And I just have to be 
who I am on this journey with no validation. And, and that's the big coming to terms, right? Yeah. I mean, I wouldn't say no validation, but I would say that, Mm. that by doing the sports that we do, you learn an intimacy with the universe. Mm -hmm. And I mean that like, not in terms of like, hippy dippy shit but i mean there are laws that bind us and there are laws that judge us where like i find personally no offense to y'all out there but religious laws are judgmental where universal laws are binding so like the laws of physics the laws of gravity these things are things that i mean there's exceptions to all rules but in terms of swooping in terms of slack line you actually see these laws that bind us and you say, Hey universe, I see you. I want to play with you. So it's that intimacy that you learn. And by learning the intimacy of how to read the universe, you can play with the, it's a dance. You get to dance with like the physical world, but it's the physical world. And there's this whole metaphysical and quantum world that it is not a part of. Like the way you can walk into a room and read people's energies that is not a physical thing. That is a metaphysical thing. Mm -hmm. It has to do with physical characteristics and looks on your face and how people are holding themselves. Mm -hmm. But in terms of art, that art is not just a physical choice. So in terms of like the world record free solo, like, is that a highlighting or something? A highline. Yeah, yeah. So you well, walk so for a high the, line. For the audience. Yeah. Yeah. So it's basically setting up a tightrope, but it's a slack line. It's made of webbing and you walk across it really high off the ground with no leash, no protection. And like all free the soloing are free and climbing. Solo. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. so I first saw Dean doing that and I wanted to break his record because I knew that this was the length. I knew that if I trained this much, I knew that if I was this current, that I could take the risk and mitigate it where it wasn't me risking my life. It was me developing a sense of certain control of breathing techniques of physical aptitude of mental fortitude. Like these things are trainable. And so learning to learn, learning that concept of learning, learning that concept of skill, mastery, purpose, autonomy, having the choice, like all of those skills are not in vain. It's not like winning the championship means nothing. You taught yourself to be intimate and to learn something, which means you can learn anything. It's just that a lot of people stick with what they're good at because it feels to be good to be good at something. Yeah, it's comfortable. Super comfortable. But you don't learn shit from comfort. You learn shit from discomfort and seeking discomfort. So that's why this year I'm like going into yoga, going into weightlifting, things I'm not good at. Because by learning, it keeps the humility about your life and that removes ego. And so by removing ego, you actually can understand that learning is so easy to do from so many people and you don't know everything. You're not in control of everything. So by being the best, by getting first place, it teaches you how to learn. But you have to continue to learn and understand that there's a million things you don't know shit about. Yeah. So I want to speak on the concept of art a little bit because I highly relate. And I, I don't know if you've listened to me speak at all, but I hold art as our highest calling. I believe that when we are creating art, that we are truly receiving what the universe's potential is and that it is being channeled through us. It's not something that we individually are actually creating. We're just tapping into source and that source energy comes into us through whatever means in the quantum And it's expressed through whatever way we feel compelled to do so. And I believe as a society, when societies put art at the, as their highest purpose, and we look back at ancient societies and we see societies that have made these incredible artful expressions. And you look at the Egyptians, for example, or any of these ancient cultures where temples and monuments are made that are just breathtakingly beautiful. And, and they mean so much and they last to this day as long lasting expressions of our potential as human beings to be deeply connected to the universe. So that flow, that expression, that like desire to just go create something that hasn't, especially something that we feel like hasn't been done before, that it's it's this beautiful dance with the universe that we all just love to be in. And there's a, there's a freedom 
in it where we're not necessarily in control, but somebody or something else is, and we're watching it all happen. And I absolutely love when that happens, when I'm sure you can relate, but I can think of times where even at a mixing board, when I've been DJing, where I've seen my hand reach over and turn a knob without even having any conscious understanding of what I was about to do or why I was doing it and seen and heard the adjustment that came as that little movement and known that it was the right thing to do, but never having made the decision to do it. And so. But did you see and hear it before you felt it? I, I mean, it's. It's, it's like, it's like, it's like known. action reaction. Yeah, it's known like that's the thing to do, but I didn't even think about it, you know? And so well, now, what makes the difference between a swoop and art? There's nothing. They're not, there's no difference. They are art. So that for me, can, can what makes piloting? an artistic swoop? It's the, the, however, for, how do I say for this? You, like, like, what's the difference between that guy swooping and that it's shit's Whether you're art. trying, whether there's like, I'm like, and I'm trying to do it or I'm allowing it to happen. You know, yeah. you can just feel or observe or see when somebody is moving in a way where there's no effort involved. I watched a surf clip last night. I shared it with Dukes and it's, it just, looks it, like there's no effort. Yeah, but it's, it's, it's years of practice. It's, yeah. It's a lifetime yeah. of it, right? This guy's dropping in on this wave. It's a gnarly wave. I've seen hundreds of videos on this wave. People crash all the time on it. It's got this huge, nasty Curl. Oh, got the Jengus lip. It was terrible, right? And he drops off this, he gets in the notch, then there's this big lip and he hops over the edge, replants, and then the wave's about to kill him. And he cuts way back up into the barrel that you can't even see coming yet. And the whole time you're just like, this is like, you're so far ahead of what's happening, you know? And so I want to bring this back to you specifically in the sense that, you know, sometimes called sketchy Andy yeah. has been through some horrifyingly terrifying close calls with, mm -hmm. with death. And I've seen you just move remember. in those ways where it's pure instinct. That's as comes from a lifetime of, of training those instincts. Yeah. yeah. I would separate it into there being, especially with base jumping where that kind of sketchy Andy kind of came from my interlude between climbing and highlining and becoming a quote unquote base jumper, which I still don't consider myself a base jumper um, <laughs> for good damn reasons. I'll tell you guys that later. Um, I would say the, uh, the difference between what I see in art and sport is that art demands perfection where sport gives you every reason just to make a good decision not to do it. So in a sport jump, what makes a good sport jump in base jumping where you jump off of this fixed object Tombstone, for instance, it's 400 feet. You can jump, take two seconds. You have margin. It's a big, safe wall. You have every reason to say that that's a quote unquote safe base jump. But then we all know there's no real safe base jump. No such thing. Yeah. Where in a base jump where everything has to go perfectly, and even then, you might not be safe. And there's every reason not to do it, except for the art of base jumping. That is where I love to have my personality come out, my expression of art. Because mm -hmm. it's one thing to make a base jump where people don't go there because it's a long hike. It's hard to access. But there's another beautiful thing where people pass that jump every day and they don't go there because of every reason not to. Mm -hmm. And they don't want to jump it because they'll say, I don't have the desire to. Why would I desire to risk that? And a lot of it is theory, but in actuality, it's possible. In actuality, perfection allows you to do those things. And so by thinking artistically, you actually lose support by a lot of people. That's why free solo is hard because everybody who loves you cares about you. It's not a good idea to walk free solo. Don't do that. For three years, I free soloed all the time, listening to my best friends, my lovers, listening to my parents, my family everybody telling me not to do it mm. but i wasn't doing something dangerous i was building up currency to something that was in control at a high level and so by risk mitigating step by step you actually build yourself up there so i always thought that it was the fact that i'd been a world record slackliner or a four-time world champion trickliner that i trained these reaction speeds to like 
hit the cliff and turn around and land in the talus field and blah, blah, blah. But what I realized from my emotional breakdown was that part of my character that pissed a lot of people off, sorry to everybody out there, was I was reactionary. I didn't have what is in the middle of receiving information and reacting to that information. There's this whole thing right here called process where you (laughs) process the information emotionally, see what you want to say, how you want to say it. You think about like, I didn't do that. I got information. I gave information. That was it. And it was usually hateful, vulgar, attention bound, egotistical, anything that you, I didn't care. I just wanted to say how I felt. And I just blah. And a lot of people love that about me, but a lot of people will never talk to me again because of it. But as I make steps and understand what process is, I realize that by the time I'm hitting the cliff in the wrong way, I wasn't reacting to a situation in the moment. I was actually reacting to a situation I'd replayed in my head 10,000 times. I had processed that accident. I had processed that mistake. And I was ready for that instance, even if it was random or this and that. And there is luck involved, guaranteed. Because if I was like 10 feet higher, the boulder would have been there. If I was 10 feet lower, the tree would have been there. But if I was a tenth of a second slower, it also would have been bad. So there is this luck thing and this skill thing, but luck is just opportunity meeting preparation. And for all of this shit, I was prepared. And so that's why I've never broken a bone. That's why I've never gotten stitches. And that's why I've opened fucking hundreds of jumps out here that are like just completely not even not repeated, but no one even wants to. Yeah. Why would you? you, Why would you? It's because it's art. Yeah. But the art of base jumping is something that is not grasped by a lot of people they want a base jump to be a base jumper yeah but being a base jumper these days is not ideal base jumpers are terrible at life Mm -hmm. so if you're actually a great base jumper most likely you're super good at something else so like the top base jumpers in the world that i see like right now are like also incredible divers incredible surfers incredible like motorcycle riders and 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 like they're just base jumping is like the frosting on their cake of athletic ability where when i look at people who are base jumpers they're kind of not athletes i would agree and so and so it's kind of like for me it's hard to respect just a base jumper today because they're kind of losers and i totally mean that like like not like mean i just mean you don't know how to do all the other shit and so, like, that's why base jumpers can't climb. That's why base jumpers can't rig. That's why base jumpers don't do rescues for the most part and have to fucking get pulled off the shit by other people. And so. So, so let's go back to um, this reaction thing that we were talking about for a second there, because I think there's something else I want to dig into. Mm-hmm. So for me, what I've come to realize in myself through the help of plant medicines, which has really guided me to this deeper understanding, is that I've been operating in a state of resistance unconsciously my entire life in a state of having to feel like I need to defend everything that I do or say or feel or love or express to yourself or to other people. Uh, it's, it's like defending my identity, defending who I am versus as if who I am is permanent, as if who I am is like some magical thing that doesn't change, that isn't going to go away one day that is just, you know, needs to be perfect, needs to be number one, needs to be the best. So when, when I've felt confronted or attacked or challenged or, you know, anybody comes at me with something that is at all threatening on, on a subconscious level, I would also resist that the same way that you were just talking about. And so I'm curious, uh, you said that you had a breakdown. I want to hear about that a little more. And I want to talk a little bit more about this processing of emotions and how do we what have we learned or what are we learning Mm -hmm. about receiving whatever the universe is sending to us because inevitably that voice that is coming at us is like this big circle where it's inside of us it goes out to the universe it comes back through some other person and they mirror whatever it is that we need to hear that we know is part of ourself and it triggers something inside so yeah let's go down here a little well i'd say that the hardest part about being um a high achiever or to have talent or to um, be on the podium or to be a winner is that the more you win, the more 
the people want to see you lose. 100%. I know this. And so it's really a hard thing to try your best, be the best, blah, 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 this and that, even though like be the best, what the hell does that even mean? You mean be the best in that day, in that moment, the people who don't even know what Slackline is and they're the judges who have, who is the winner? Like it doesn't even really mean anything. It's who is having the most fun, who's bringing up the most people, who's the most sportsmanlike, who's the most stylish, who's doing the best in terms of just being awesome who you are is the best. It's not what you do that's the best. And so I had to learn very quickly that when you get to a high level, your word actually is stronger than other people's words because you have experience. So people want to know what line you think is the best or what ricking technique you have because of your experience, because of your success. And so by having that higher word, you actually have to and I hate saying this, accept personal responsibility for your actions. And so, <laughs> and so <laughs> actions and reactions are two different things. So a reaction is something where you are attacked, you are emotionally hurt, you are somebody hurts you or says something or you want to defend yourself or whatever, and you react to try to defend yourself, but you're hurting other people for no reason. And so that's what happened to me is I learned that I was actually being really mean when I didn't have to be. I could have been compassionate could have been empathetic, could have not been vulgar, could have not been rude, could have not been violent, could have not been so many things, but I chose purposefully to hurt other people. And for my own benefit from sometimes and for my own selfishness sometimes. And by doing that, at a certain point, I like lost it. I like unraveled because I couldn't keep up with myself. I couldn't figure out which direction to go in. I couldn't be content, couldn't, couldn't have enough records, couldn't have enough sex, couldn't do enough drugs, couldn't be, couldn't like literally couldn't have enough of anything. And with, with somebody who can't have enough, even if you have the world, it will still not be enough. And so I got to this point where I just fizzled. And what was left was like my friends who weren't my friends, my community who didn't even respect what I was doing like the town that hated me for being sexist, racist, violent, fucked hard. Like mm. it got to a point where I realized that by seeking attention, I got attention to the details of my life that I didn't want to accept, which was that like, I didn't know everything. I wasn't prepared in a lot of situations. I didn't have the community's best interest in hand a lot. I was super selfish, wanting to like have the glory, but not give thanks to the pyramid of people holding up this top spot. And for the longest time, I was just the top of this little triangle where you are the peak of the pyramid. But what's the peak of the pyramid without the fucking pyramid? Mm -hmm. And so you have to give thanks. You have to give gratitude. You have to like embrace the process more than your actual personal progression. And so that's where my breakdown came from was because I got too involved in giving other people too much strength in my own happiness, where it was more about what other people thought about my actions than what I thought about my actions. I wanted first place rather than doing my best. Mm -hmm. I wanted to be seen as sexy rather than actually feeling sexy to myself, where <laughs> like your own good habits, your own dedication, your own diet, your own inclination into being a better person every day it's not a sprint it's a marathon to have those habits is what actually gives you a profound sense of being profound sense of gratitude for yourself and appreciation for yourself where it's so easy to see, seek that instantaneously from things that don't actually help you that's why donuts are so good you eat a donut immediately satisfying yeah. <laughs> it's like crispy yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and like sugary and it's like immediately satisfying where you go to the gym one day and you just hurt and you feel weak and you leave and there's no gain there's no nothing you just it's all hard and and there's no payoff and so until you actually get into the dedication over the course of time which i think time is really what art is is like an expression of how much time you focused on something the intimacy of like seeing the details those kind of things i think that's what's actually to wrap on back to what makes a better swoop is the time it takes to know the details of what everything is perfect. Like how to, how to narrow your margin, how to like increase your speed, how to do it. So it, like you said, looks easy. Mm -hmm. 
Because when, it's, when yeah. it's effortless, that's the crazy thing about Slackline too, is that you try so hard until you realize you just have to let go. And so now I'm kind of like stepping back and trying to um, not be involved at all with external attention. That's why you guys might see me post less or you might see me like not be reacting to any kind of thing about this accident or birds posts or tandem base or nothing. I'm not, I'm gone out, gone, ixnay, no, nothing from Andy. And so it's um tremendously beneficial. So, so this whole um, external validation that's been the source of all validation, the source of love essentially is this, you know, whether people are responding negatively or positively, they're responding. So because they're responding, we're being validated that we have worth it. Our, our, we're, our expression, whatever it is, is conjuring a response in another person. And therefore our energy has some place on this planet to say, I'm actually here. What I'm doing is actually, you know, got some energy to it. And so I feel validated by people responding to it. So now that you're consciously pulling back from there, what are your changes in habit and behavior? And like, what are you doing with yourself to learn to love yourself, validate yourself and not need to seek it from external sources? It basically comes down to planning your perfect day. What are you actually grateful for? And so when you do your perfect day, all of a sudden you're making your bed. You're eating good meals. You're doing activities that are pleasurable and slow and you slow down. You're breathing. You're you're present. And so you can grow plants when you're present every day. Mm -hmm. You can water them and feed them and and care about something other than yourself. Your chickens can grow and lay eggs and sustain themselves. And you can also like tell you things, but they don't speak English, but you know when they're thirsty, you know when they're hungry. And you actually open your eyes to all these other intimate connections that are also art. And so the art of living is not just in doing, it's in being. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I'm doing right now is I'm opening my mind and trying to be bad at things. That's the number one thing I'm trying to change right now is to find the things I'm bad at and embrace them. And so bad at yoga, don't even know what it's about. Go to yoga, you know, bad at going to the gym because I, I've never done physical training. I don't understand like the neurological connections between different muscles and using muscles and learning all that stuff is amazing. Super bad at video editing. So going and watching videos on editing and how to like tell a story and all these things and really embracing what I don't know rather than trying to create something new or spectacular. Those are also parts of my life, but it's not all of my life. So in my history as a pilot, uh, when there was a real big turning point for me was when I looked at my overall averages and I saw where my weakest game was. And I saw that's the part of my performance where I typically have the lowest score. And so just relating this to this whole competition, kind of like how can we use simple systems to address like deeper, more meaningful topics? Um, for me, the accuracy game was always lowest because I wasn't passionate about it. I didn't think that it was artful. I thought going and landing in the box was boring because it wasn't me pushing myself to my absolute limit, right? It was me kind of backing off from my ability to go to 110%. You know, I would like the power of doing speed runs or doing distance runs. And because that meant I had to give everything that I had and I liked pushing that edge. But the accuracy game means staying at like 80% and being all finesse and being really tuned in and really dialing this in. And when I made accuracy the game that I trained the most and I focused all my attention on becoming the best at that and making that my strong suit no longer my weak suit, but actually my game that I started to win more than anything else, then my overall performance became well-rounded and um, a better overall performer and com competitor. And so when we pull this back into life and say, okay, what am I bad at? So right now I'm deep into financial planning and doing all this crazy spreadsheets and bookwork stuff that I 
typically hand off to somebody else to do because I just don't like doing it. It's like I don't like doing his own act runs because it's my weakness because I'm not good at it. Not that it's too hard and I can't learn it, just that I'm not prioritizing it in my life because I I consider it less worthy of my time because it's not me at 110%. It's me going, oh, I kind of suck at this, but I need to sit down and grind. And so whether that's doing spreadsheets or whether that's doing yoga or whether that's meditating, because meditating can sure feel like that. Man, my meditation last night felt like 20 minutes of me just thinking about stuff while I'm supposed to be free of thoughts. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and I'm like, I've been practicing this twice a day, every day for like five years. And for 15 before that, I would do it consistently all the time, you know? So I'm curious to ask, do you meditate? Is that something you've been practicing? Meditation is definitely um, key, I think. But in terms of just sitting and meditating, it's not really how I meditate. Um, the meditation kind of runs that I've been doing has to do with taking care of other things. So letting my mind free of all other thought by being intimate with other items. So when I go into my greenhouse and I garden, I get to be with other life forms and and sacrifice my own willingness to hold on to my life and by transferring that consciousness into another being. And so being like, why, why are you unhappy? You know, like is like type being of curious. Like, yeah, being like, are you hungry? Are you because it can't speak to you with words, but you see that it's unhappy. The the leaves have started wilting. There's a little yellow on it. You can download plant apps and like point it, and it's like maybe there's too little light, and you put it in a light place. It's still unhappy. Maybe it needs food. But having that time to remove your existence and understand, like it's almost like binding with other existence where you melt into the world of like oneness where like I am my chickens. I am the raccoon trying to break into the chickens. I am my flowers. I am my blueberries. I am my grass. And so by having good habits for yourself, you actually open up habits to sustain life in general. And it really connects you into other things. And that's where I find calmness, tranquility, peace, and silence is where my focus is not on myself. It's on something else. And then my mind quiets. And so there's this um, idea, concept from the Tao, where it's like the emptiness is what actually gives you the power. So like, um, for instance, like a pitcher is a clay pot that surrounds emptiness, but the emptiness can then be filled with water. And then you have a cup, which is clay that surrounds emptiness, which then you can fill with water to use to drink. Or like this trailer is six sides of walls that surrounds emptiness. Yet this is the space that we're using right now to have this podcast. And so that emptiness is actually where the power comes from. So in my brain and in my mind, it's always constantly tick-tock, tick-tock, tick-tock. And I'm trying to learn to be the librarian of my mind where you have to shush people and silence your cell phone (laughs) and sleep. (laughs) You You be quiet now. You be quiet now. And it's, it's that you don't just need that silence. You deserve it. You deserve tranquility and peace within your own mind. And that's where. So, so Ari, I'm, I'm going to cut you off for a second. But Ari, our good friend, he, I used the word deserve one time when we were talking and he kind of gave me a little sideways and he's like, oh, be careful with that word, the word deserve, because this whole journey, the life's, you know, the life's journey, uh, you know, we get what we deserve, whether we, we, you know, want or think or know or whatever might be there around it. But this idea of like, a we deserve or I deserve is a, it's kind of a karmic expression, right? To we, we, whatever we put out, we're going to resonate an energy outwards. And that's going to mean that the things that are resonating at that same level is what we're going to attract towards us. See, that's so, not only how I look at karmic action. I kind of see karmic action is that it's not that it comes back to you. It's that it outlives you. So who you are, what you say, what you do is one of the only things that actually moves past your, your physical body. Mm -hmm. It's not that if I punch you in the face, I'm going to get punched in the face one day. It's that if I punch you in the face and someone hears about it and that story (laughs) travels around forever, I will have punched you in the face for hundreds of years. And then other people will be able to judge whether or not this is good, bad, ugly, the next thing. So that's why being is very important because like we're all going to die. 
we're all going to get old. We're all going to have to say goodbye to all of our possessions and all of our karma is also going to live on way past us. The other thing is that we all will eventually get sick. And so those are like the five Buddhist practices that you're supposed to remind yourself every friggin' day is that like, I might be sick. I'm, I'm, I'm going to get old. I'm going to die one day. I'm going to lose everything that I, I've ever built, saved all of it. And also everything that I've ever done will live on further than me. But karma is not a scale. I don't believe. Yeah. I, 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 I believe that in its sense there, but I also believe that there's this resonant effect in that we're all vibrating at a particular frequency and objects are proven. If you, whatever you vibrate at, it's, if, if anything else is tuned to that frequency, it will also vibrate at the same time. So like, you know, when you talked about having you know vulgar or aggressive expressions where you send that energy out into the world, but you get that immediately back. Right. Like that's yeah. the response that comes back. And if you put out, you know, tender, loving, vulnerable, authentic, you're going to get that back, you know? So there's the instant karma in that sense, you know, and then there's kind of the, the infinite karma, which is that legacy that you leave behind. So, so let's talk. But sometimes about like if, so, if you give someone your bike to borrow, does that mean necessarily that they're going to have a bike or even let you borrow their bike? No. It's no, never, no, no, it's, no, it's, no, it's no, not no, like no, that. No, so, it's not like that. So, so sometimes you have more than other people so you can give more. And so like, that's the beauty of giving is that not everybody has the ability to give. And so it's, it's, it's not an, it's not a trend. I don't, I, well, I don't universe, you don't know, but I, or you're the one who knows, I don't really know, but I don't think karma is something that can be definitively transactional yeah. kind of thing. And so will I say that all the terrible things that I've done and all the negative and bad mistakes I've ever made, will I, do I think those are going to come back to me? Maybe, but do, are people's reactions of how they treat me now different? A hundred percent, a hundred percent, but they're not going to do the same thing to me because good people don't do bad things sometimes, or oh, that's not true. Sometimes you do bad things for the right reason. Sometimes you do the right things for the wrong reason. And I think that that is more transactional and more like a moral, a moral debate between people rather than karma actually having power over our lives. I want to talk about a couple things as well. Um, so you're a tandem base jumper, which is a very limited number of people in the world who do Excuse that. Me, it's the tandem base jumper. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this is an, laughed, that this is an effort you. in, so you have other people's lives in your hands, but you're equally sharing an experience together. I've done thousands of um, skydiving tandem jumps yeah. where take people for their first skydives and Andy takes people for their first base jumps on tandem um, base jumping equipment. And earlier you were talking about that, like responsibility to others, thinking of others, the relationship to others. How has that changed? the way that you move and think and act now that you're in this regular practice of, you know, a life threatening, um, experience with people who don't have the same lifetime of training and experience, you yeah. know, so they don't have the skill set, They don't have the reaction. You're really responsible for their best interest. And mm -hmm. now we're in this conundrum of, Oh yeah, I know I've been an ass. I know I've played, really rude at times, but now I'm the guy responsible for other people in this sense. So how do you wear that coat? Like, how does that feel to you? I mean, from my personal standpoint, I'm actually not a very bad person. I, I feel as if I never said you're a bad person. I, like a I never lot said of people that. give me a really person. fucking bad role. And like, y'all it's consensual. They're like, like, I haven't like, it takes two to tango for a lot of the stuff that I've like, quote unquote done. Um, how could I have been more uh, eloquent with my statements? Absolutely. Can you argue that some of the shit that I said wasn't important at the time? No, that shit needed to be said. Did it need to be say, said like it was? Probably not. Yeah, I mean, I, I've done that. You've, yeah. you've seen or heard me express poorly with, you know, but, passive aggressive bullshit. Um, I do embrace the role of sketchy Andy. Um, he needed to be part of the community to bring up subjects on topics that were hard to identify, hard to speak about, and to actually bring up conversations about emotional topics, spiritual topics, physical topics, 
He was an important character. He still is. So a lot of people love sketchy Andy, but they love and hate someone who is not real. He's, he's the embodiment of like shadow puppets on a wall. It's like everything you want me, everything I yeah. want you to see, you see, but everything you don't, you don't. So in terms of tandem base jumping, you're not really base jumping with sketchy Andy because the reason why I started tandem base jumping was to not do dangerous base jumps. So I love dangerous base jumps. They're the only way that I ever feel alive base jumping because when you're, the way that you were talking about how you're in the moment and present when you're doing something perfectly, I call that the flow state. Yeah, And so a lot of people do. So the thing about flow state is it's where your skill level meets your challenge level. And there's this line that goes like this. And that line is right on the point of joy. So at your skill level and challenge level, you're right here is full enjoyment and you without the enjoyment you don't actually reach flow state if you're on the the side of too much challenge with too little skill you get anxiety Mm -hmm. when you're on the side of too much skill and not enough challenge you get to control which right next to control is relaxation right next to relaxation is boredom right next to boredom is apathy comfort yeah and on the other side of that line apathy is on both sides if you have too much skill and not enough challenge apathetic if you have too much challenge and not enough skill apathetic you don't give a shit either way and so finding that skill point and that level where you can enter this very delicate and i would say glorious point of skill challenge and joy that's what i do with tandem base so i get people to a section where i can read their energy the first thing i try to do is understand who they are where they came from why they're here And then I try to adhere to each individual person to get them to the edge and match them precisely where their skill and their challenge is so that when they break that barrier, that's why I have people count down five, four, three, two, one. When they count down and they choose not only to be courageous, which is physical courage, but they also have moral courage which is trust in me. So by saying three, two, one, and choosing to jump, that's where the joy comes in. So they, their challenge level's here, skill level's here, and then they choose to take the risk themselves. And that is empowerment of like not only them, but their future of making that conscious step in each and every one of their lives. And so... I would say it's a life-threatening sport, but for the most part, the preparation, the skill set, the decision-making is an equation we figured out. Yeah, it's, it's, I, would, I mean, it's quite manageable, right? It's a pretty simple process overall. It's, it's not that hard. You jump off a cliff, you open a parachute, you land it, done. Right. Done. Yeah. And just keep it that simple. I want to. It's about the other person enjoying it though. Yeah. So this is where I want to kind of take us to is you talked a lot about your early years and say the, how you would game a teacher, right. By like listening to the person, you're really reading people, right. You're, you're getting into that space. So I know the same game, right. I was very good at this and you're obviously a highly intelligent person as am I. And we can look at a situation and kind of see the plays that are going on in people's minds in the room and read this, you know, read all of it. And so do you feel like this in in tandems when you're, you're, you're like gently helping somebody to where they want to go, right. By like matching their energy, you're going to find out kind of where's their comfort, where's their discomfort. And you're going to stay just on the edge of the whole, like stand, step inside their discomfort zone enough so that they feel like there's something there that they could lean on when they're discom when they're in mm-hmm. that space. Right. And so this feels like a positive use for the same skill set that was getting used negatively in the past. Would you agree? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And it's not just tandem jumps. I take people rock climbing, canyoning, rappelling, rope swings. We do like commercial shoots and things like that. So it's not just tandeming. It's, it's more about just energy control in general. And you just get jaded eventually at the risks we take. And so a lot of people just haven't ever taken the risks or ever gone on side or ever put any kind of um, energetical connection into physical development. 
where most of my entire world was in trying to discover the physical world and trying to master the physical world, trying to master everything physical. And so now I would say that in the power of reading people and connection and being liked immediately and like all of those things that I benefited off of and, and purposefully benefited off of and still do, but it's more of a, um, it's more of like out of a need before where I don't really need that stuff anymore. So now I am, that's why I'm pulling back from being that dude. And so the people who know me, know me, the people who don't, don't, mm. the people who dislike me forever will always dislike me regardless of the change or anything like that. And I can't control that. So if people want to come and talk to me and hang out and see the changes that I've made, then awesome. But um, in terms of like my business, it's undeniable the safety record that I have in all of my businesses. I've run over a thousand tours, not a single injury, not a single accident, not a single upset, mistake, nothing. And I just did like, I think my 726th tandem base jump. Wow. With no injuries, no inju- no accidents, no nothing from five years old and 40 pounds to 285 pounds and autistic, every single person safe. And so do I need recognition for that? No, it's not about that. That's why I was joking about being like the tandem base jumper. Like nothing that anyone is doing in tandem base right now is a uh, new, um, it's been done. It's been done by other people and everybody else should actually deserve the credit. So if you want to know the original tandem base person I, in the I, lab, I, I, yeah. he's dead. Yeah. You know, if you want to know the original tandem base jumpers, they were in the eighties. Yeah. So I didn't design these parachutes. I didn't build any of this stuff. I didn't, I didn't sew every, like my containers without the help of the entire history of the parachuting community, without the help of the rigors, and the businesses that have given me the gear without the help of everybody in the slack line industry who taught me how to rig, taught me how to walk, taught me like we're talking people like there's thousands and thousands of people. All that I'm good at is flying a parachute that I didn't even create and reading people and helping them have a good time in an industry that I went to school for. And I was taught this by literally other professionals. So have I changed anything in tandem base? Zero. The only thing I've ever really done is permitted a new exit. Mm-hmm. And it's only open six months a year. <laughs> but like, this isn't the recognition I need. Yeah. This is something to keep me from needing to do dangerous jumps. So now I do the safest jumps. And all of a sudden, by doing the safest jumps, I'm jumping with a lot of our friends. I'm not alone. So let me, let me bring things to a closing question here. Mm-hmm. Um. I don't know if you had a chance to listen to my last podcast yet about reflecting on my 50th just passed recently, just turning 50 and an exercise that I've done a few times, which I really think you'll probably appreciate, um, which helped bring me into a better understanding of myself and an alignment of the parts of being, because I hear the similar story from you. So uh, it's writing your eulogy in the third person and hearing like somebody else's voice speak about who you were and what you did and how that affected people. And then writing your um, legacy in the omnipotent, like God's voice, right? And then writing your manifesto to say, what is it that you really want to do with your life? Like, what do I really, what is it I really want to do with my life? What do I want out of this? How do I want to change who I am and have been into who I am? want to be and what I want to do in order to leave a legacy and a eulogy that all line up so that that third person's perspective reads the same as God's version of the perfect you and your own story of saying, what, what, what do you really want from the rest of your life? Oh, now that you're yeah. still here. You know? I, mean, I would say that it's pretty easy. I think the, the point of philosophy in general is not only just to learn how to live a great life, but learn how to die a great death, calmly, respectfully, and, and, and appreciatively. And so if you can learn how to do that, it's all about accepting value, the values that you hold. And so things like courage, temperance, wisdom, justice, like the core values of human nature, expressing those and uh, those take energy. 
and effort. And it's, it's always hard to do those things. It's tranquility. All these things are the things I'm trying to embrace much more every day and to learn how to die a valiant and beautiful death calmly where you can understand that time is infinite and that all will eventually be lost and then restarted and done again. And it all comes to pass, right? It comes to pass. To pass. Exactly. And it shrinks down and explodes and shrinks down and explodes. And maybe the Hindus had it right that this has been done more than 40,000 times. I don't really know. But calmness, contentment, and joy, um, those things are, are what my, my life is about these days. And as long as you can cultivate that with the beautiful relationships and to understand that we are all one, that all the, the best things and the most easy things in your life where you feel the freest and the joy and love that you bring, you can have that same gratitude and appreciation for all the hardest things in your life all the people who've crossed you, all the lessons you've learned from people who annoy you or steal from you or anything like that. But no one's negative effects on your life are a good reason for you to be negative or distrusting Mm -hmm. or mean or unkind or unruly or vulgar. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So that is where I'm taking my life and my life's purpose is to. I'm really happy to see the growth in your character. Uh, we've known each other for some time and, and I've seen those expressions that I know you're wishing to leave behind you and working to leave behind you. And I feel the same in myself, of course, you know, as we all do. Um, I think you're a beautiful person, Andy. You're a beautiful soul, Jim. Yeah, I love you very much. I really appreciate you coming on the show today and being open and sharing and, and engaging. Um, and, and with that, if, if you've enjoyed today's show, uh, I'd encourage you to please subscribe on youtube that really helps to get us a bigger following and we can get some monetization going on the show through that channel also want to thank uh, melanie curtis uh, at meliecurtis.com for her amazing being an amazing teammate um, i really enjoyed today's show man it's super yeah fun. thanks and yeah. if you guys want to come out to moab check out basejumpmoab.com if you want to go rock climbing rappelling canyoneering slacklining tandem base jumping especially hit us up check us out uh, one last year, if you want to become a member of the Trusted Journey family, go to trustedjourney.today, click the Donate Now on Patreon button, and make a donation on there, and that'll get you into that curated Facebook group, which we all um, take part in, and that's going to be a place where you're going to now be welcomed to as a sh- member of the show. Perfect. So you get to engage that family there, too, and a great place to practice all these skills. Uh, and, yeah thank you so much really really do love you brother love you love you man and uh yeah rock on world yeah keep laughing (laughs) keep your best keep trusting the journey heck yeah trust that journey baby